Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbin Greek, UK's leading Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek produce. Whatever your needs, Malbin Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the divine and delicious goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK, or you can visit the shop at Art17 Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermondsey, London. Malby and Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. Hello! Welcome back to the Delicious Legacy Podcast with me, Thomas Dinas. And on today's archaeogastronomical adventure, I have the pleasure and the honor to have a fantastic guest with me. It's no other than zooarchaeologist Flint Dibble, one of my favorite people on Twitter, which um, I've been following for a few years now, like maybe four years or so, and um, I keep a close eye on his uh, adventures, on, um, on his online adventures, but more so his um, excavations and discoveries uh, from archaeological sites all over Greece. So, yeah, I'm really happy today that uh, you will um, get to hear some exciting uh, discoveries from Greece on uh, what people used to eat and what we discover and how we discover this. Um, and um, Flint kindly suggested we do a few episodes on the subject because it's a very vast and broad subject with many different uh, exciting elements. So this is going to be part one of three of, uh, of our uh, deep dive in um, zooarchaeology in ancient Greece. So stay tuned uh, for in the next uh, couple of months. We're going to get uh, more and more information about uh, the foods that ancient Greeks ate. On part one of my interview with Flynn Dibble, we have explored more broadly the zooarchaeology of ancient Greece, and we saw the discoveries that Flint uh, made in ancient Crete, specifically in the site of Azoria. On today's episode, continuing from where we've left the previous week, we're going to focus mostly on discoveries made in ancient Athens. Here's Flint to tell us more. Enjoy! We tend to think of the Greek and more broadly Mediterranean diet as some long perhaps an interrupted tradition, more or less an unchanged straight path that took us from uh, ancient Greece to modern, that we ate the same things, more or less uh, fish, goat, olive oil, olives, wine, grapes. How true is that? I suppose that in most curious people's minds is the first question. That's my <laughs> question. Yeah, how? Yeah, I think that's a good question, and I would say it's not true at all. <laughs> in the sense that diets are always changing. I think that okay. many of those components are certainly present for much of what we would call Greek prehistory and history. But, you know, we can start to see the introduction of different sources over time. So, you know, it was, it, it, the, it, during the initial Neolithic period, um, they didn't really have much olive oil or wine. Mm -hmm. That was not introduced until later. It doesn't seem... Uh, sort of later in the Neolithic period, really, is when you start, but that's thousands of years later, Yeah, is when you start seeing uh, olives and wine becoming more plentiful, and then they become more plentiful into the Bronze Age. But there's always different, and, 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 and another key ingredient that we think of today is the chicken, and uh -huh. that certainly was not introduced until much later. Right. And, yeah. and, and even these classical Athenians, they were probably not eating much chicken. Um, a little bit, yes, but uh, not very much. So the chicken we're now discovering, this is fairly recent, like it's just in the last five years, publications are coming out on this. It was not domesticated until much later than we thought. And it's domesticated sort of in the third, second millennium BC and sort of a south and Southeast Asia. It's a jungle bird. Yeah. And so it does not make its way over to the Mediterranean until the first millennium BC. The earliest reference to a chicken in Greek sort of sources is in the archaic period. And it's called a Persian bird. Mm -hmm. And so you can get this sense that maybe it was new at that time and maybe introduced from contacts with Persia. Maybe. I, it's unclear. Um, we get depictions, though, of chicken-looking type birds 
um, on some pottery. I think the earliest I've seen in a museum, it's not published and I wasn't allowed to take photos of it, but in the Heraclio Museum, there's some, you know, I mentioned those storage vessels, those pithoi with stamped and impressed decoration. It's a really common thing on Crete in the first half of the first millennium BC. And I forget what the name of the site is. I have notes on it, but I don't remember right now. Mm. I have to wait for it to be published to really publish on it. Yeah. But uh, there's some there's some pithoi with some birds that look chicken-like. And the, the description in the Heraclio Museum describes them as chicken-like uh, as well. So that might be the earliest depiction. But the earliest bones that I have, and I always, look, I have problems dating the introduction of a species to a new area from uh, text and art because they might know of these things from afar. Yeah. But that doesn't mean they've been introduced yet. Mm. And at the same time, it doesn't mean that they're like, common yet right like yeah. do, do, is it just a few people that know of this animal or is it something that everybody knows of and so the first bones that i've ever studied and that i that i think have been published in the greek world are from sort of persian destruction deposits in the athenian agora so we're talking 480 bc mm. maybe to 470 was when these deposits were filled in and uh so that's the first bone evidence, and they don't really become common until the Roman period, um, when the Romans start to really, the you know, more industrialized type farm, not industrial, that's a bad word, but more <laughs> kind of larger scale of chicken farming operations, let's say, become common. There are a lot of chicken bones at... Uh, or no, 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 at Delos as well, in Hellenistic Delos. Ah, but also right. Hellenistic Delos. Hell yeah, and then Hellenistic. I'm blanking on the site that Deborah Cosmopolis published. Is it near Pylos or? No, no, it's Eastern Peloponnese. Eastern. It's near a really cool lagoon. Stymphalos. Stymphalos. Yes, yes, okay. Yes. <laughs> the Stymphalian birds. <laughs> well, yeah, but, I, but there's also more chicken bones in those assemblages in the Hellenistic period. So at least at a couple sanctuaries, that's my point, that uh, that it, you do see more chicken appearing. But, it, you know, before that in the classical period, it exists. So by just for your uh, listeners, classical period is kind of fifth, fourth centuries B.C. Hellenistic is third, second, first centuries B.C. And then Roman would be after that, at least in archaeological historical terms of Greek world. And uh, so, yeah, so chickens really only appear kind of on the scene. And what's interesting is the art as well, because the art, especially early on, it really it really depicts them used for cockfighting. And so they have this kind of more symbolic, ritualistic mm. uh, picture of what they were in society at first rather than what we think of as food, right? You know, like a food staple. And so, yeah, so that's something that's changed drastically. But then you kind of get these ebbs and flows, right? So, you know, you listed all those ingredients, olive oil, wine, sheep, goat, pig, cow, that kind of stuff, chicken, um, grains, all this stuff, uh, pistachios even, this stuff is present in, you know, today and in the past, but, the, but it ebbs and flows in popularity. And so I think that that's really important to recognize as well. Like, you know, you can think about even today in Greece, you travel around Greece in different regions of Greece, you know, they, they, certain regions, for example, like around Kalamata, they'll talk about the, their, their strong pork tradition and they have a lot of pork delicacies like Gornopolo and, uh, yeah. and stuff like that. And, uh, and they, 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 they have a historical reason for it. It was sort of to, thumb their noses at the Ottomans, right? <laughs> because we are Christians. And, and so the, this is a region, of course, that has that connection and that history and that story. But you go to other areas of Greece and you'll see different things are more popular, right? And for different reasons. And so those the, the popularity of stuff, and I don't always think those stories are true, but I think there's embedded into sort of why people raise animals in different regions. Certain areas are more dry, and so goats are better adapted. In other areas, you have better access to water, so mm. pigs and cattle are more adapted, and Kalamata is perfect for that, with that plain right there. And so I've tried to tease this out in some of my research where you can look at changes, environmental changes, and how they impact kind of diet. And so kind of if you look at the late Bronze Age Greek world, so the Mycenaean and Minoan period, you know, sheep are king in the animal run assemblages. They, they dominate assemblages sort of at almost every settlement. They're the most common animal. And uh, 
What you get, though, in the early Iron Age, so at the first half of the first millennium BCE, is you, you get a much more diverse representation of animals at different settlements. So a lot of them actually start, some of them have cattle and pig, but a lot of them, goats become more common than sheep. And when you put that on a map, that's showing up only in the eastern areas of right. Greece and Crete. And that's really interesting to me because we've gotten more and more evidence that the climate becomes drier right at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, scholars are really interested in that. Does climate change have an impact on the collapse of kind of Mycenaean and Minoan society at the end of the Bronze Age in mm. these palaces? And uh, in the next phase, there aren't, there isn't any writing, there isn't any art, there aren't any sort of monumental uh, structures equivalent to these earlier palaces. And so is this due to climate change? And, uh, you know, one of the big questions is, can was the climate change even enough to impact sort of, you know, how they were producing food? And so I have a paper that argues, yes, it was because we see this adaptation. The climate gets drier. And in the drier regions of Greece and Crete, which is the east, the eastern part of the Peloponnese and Crete gets half the rainfall that the western half does mm. um, because of the mountain ranges that run down the middle. And so they are adapting to it by shifting to more goat. Does that mean they stopped eating sheep and pig and cow? No, but goat becomes more common, right? Yeah. Another thing that becomes more common across the Greek world at that time are olives. And so what it seems like to me and others who study pollen and, and plant remains is that there's this shift in how sort of uh, food production is practiced. So... Uh, you could think of, of food production methods on a spectrum from sort of intensive and intensive is what you do when you have like a small garden, right? Like I'm saying like you and me, right. it's like horticulture, you put a lot of effort into it. You, you make sure that it has the right fertilizer, you water it every day, you, you really manage that, that plot of land very intensively, yeah. right? And then versus what you might do if you're a farmer that has many, 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 many acres of land, mm. um, you're going to use methods that are maybe not as intensive. And so that we call that extensive management. And so, you know, you might have irrigation channels, but you're not going to go out there and water it every day, right? And so it, intensive versus extensive. And at, at this time, it seems like, at least I would argue, they might have smaller plots of land where they're putting in a lot of energy into sort of intensive management. Yeah. And then the rest of it is kind of left the, for more extensive management, let's say. And that might not be growing grain, but that might be letting tree crops sort of just they, – they require a lot less effort if yeah. you let them grow and then – harvest a small amount of, of, of the produce from them. And so that might be one. Of, and also, they're more likely to go wild. Olives will go wild if you don't manage them. And that might also explain some of the uptake in olive pollen. So both of these things right. um, could explain that. And that would make sense in the face of climate change, where you need to be more intensive with your primary productive plots of land, your grains and your legumes and, and stuff like that while you can allow the tree crops to kind of be an adaptation in the larger landscape. Mm. Okay, great. <laughs> and so in that sense, I'd argue that what we picture of kind of, you know, you go to Greece to get, today, you've been there, right? And, and, and we see this kind of picture of, A, you don't see the pigs anymore because the pigs are in factory farms, right? Yeah. Same with the chickens. You, unless you go to some villages where people still keep chickens. Yeah, only, chickens, all, only in a village, hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, only in some villages as well. And so a lot of those are in factory farms, so you don't see them. But what you see are kind of these larger herds of sheep and goat in the landscape that are just kind of roaming around up and down seasonally in the lowlands in the winter and the uplands in the summer. Yeah. And uh, that probably was less common in the past. Um, and so that's something you should picture differently, um, where people probably actually had much small, probably most of the animals came from smaller herds yeah. that, that were sort of attached to your plots of land, right? And so you're probably feeding them fodder and stubble from, from your plots of land and less of that larger herds moving up and down. And this is a debate that's been going on sort of, I don't know, for about a hundred years among Greek historians right. about whether what we see today in Greece and over the last hundred years, if that's what they were doing in ancient Greece. And uh, 
I, my guess is no, though my project now is actually geared towards answering that question. I'm doing something called a uh, isotope analysis mm -hmm. where I drill into the teeth of these animals and uh, you sort of powderize uh, parts of the teeth into the enamel powder, which you can then put in a mass spectrometer and you can get these isotope ratios and they relate to diet. So, uh, and you can, you, they also relate to the season of the year where if you take multiple wow. samples on a tooth, I can tell once I have a bunch of them and I plot the oxygen signature, whether they're from the winter or the summer uh, period. Um, so the drier versus wetter months of the year. This is and so cool. So, yeah, and so I can look how the diet of the animal changes and whether they're moving around because you get the geological signature from strontium, whether they're moving around uh, seasonally. Mm. And uh, my initial data set, which I have about 30 of them done uh, from Azoria, shows that really only about a third of them seem to be doing what we would think of as this up-down movement mm. and mobility and their diets changing along that kind of pattern, while the rest of them aren't. So uh, it's a lot less common than we'd think of today and probably most of the animals. And other people's published data also matches that. Yeah. Um, so like Catherine Bishop's published some stuff from Central Greece, um, just a few teeth that show that as well. And from what I've heard from talks from other people, it's, it's very diverse. They're doing both and they're doing a variety of things. But we have to imagine probably most of the animals is in smaller herds, uh, connected to farmland um, mm. and, and, and landowners, yeah. Fertile land, agriculturally productive and importantly of significant size, was at a premium in ancient Greek uh, mainland. Generally, the soils were considered poor for cultivation of wheat and support bigger populations. That's why many left to create colonies around the Mediterranean. People wouldn't have massive tracts of land on their, of their own. Well, a lot of people think of it, in, and today as well, you think of uh, pastoralism as almost disconnected from agriculture. Mm -hmm. So you have like pastoralists that have these larger herds and they travel with them. Like you could think of today in Northern Greece, like the Vlach people or the Sarakatsani, yeah. who, uh, you know, who travel along with large herds of sheep and goats. And people are, are actually studying, uh, I, I've heard some ethno-archaeologists that are studying these uh, modern peoples um, in order to understand how we might look for similar behavior in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is what people thought was fairly common. And you see it on Crete today. You know, you, had, you get animal herders, right, who they focus on animal husbandry. And you do occasionally get references in ancient texts to people that were like, shepherds, right? And that's their profession. And so that's where people got the idea that the, this was the primary production of animals were shepherds who owned large herds and they would travel around with their large herds in a sense, right? Mm. Um, and you get, you, I'm not saying this didn't exist, but I think that that's the, the minority of how animals were produced in the past. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a more nuanced, complicated picture. Yeah. I don't think Yeah, it's great to have all this data to pinpoint places that uh, the animals were uh, reared, et cetera. And it's key yeah. because, you know, we, we like to think because we just have a one-sided picture, like going back to the beginning, we have this one-sided picture that's very small from the past. You know, all of Greek literature was first digitized back in the 1980s, right? By mm -hmm. David Packard of, uh, you know, like one of the inheritors of Packard Bell, you know, like that co company, yeah, Packard, yeah. right? So he was a classicist, this very wealthy classicist who, uh, and it, I think he still funds uh, the excavations in Greece, like even at the maybe until recently, or maybe still does, I'm not sure, um, at the Athenian Agora. And so, uh, so he actually digitized all of Greek literature. And even in the 90s, it all fit on one CD-ROM, <laughs> right? That's how little Greek literature we have. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, counting up the most common animals that we get are sheep, goat, pig, and cow. If you count up all of the references to them, in the heyday of Greek literature, so from Homer down through the classical period, there's only like 4,000 mentions of them. Right. So it's not like it's not like we can imagine that the nuance, the complexity of the past could survive in this literature, right? It's just not it's not simply possible because we 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 don't have 
enough of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's dealing with so many different facets of life. And so we just get a snapshot of here and there. And like I said, it's very biased. It's sometimes for comedy, comedy reasons. It's other times for other reasons. And it's always very elite and Athenian and male. Mm. And so, you know, yeah, we, we, we getting this more nuanced picture. And then as we get much more of it, we'll be able to start synthesizing this kind of nuance, mm. this sort of detail that we get and, and, you know, that's really important that I hope everybody always understands. The ancient people were comp- – the ancient world was very complicated, right? Yeah. Really, really complex, just as complex as our world today, even if they don't have computers and the internet and airplanes <laughs> and junk like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree with that notion, yeah. The ancient world was a lot co- more complicated than we think. Uh, so, yeah, we need, we need <laughs> people – basically to explain to us these this, um, systems. And I think, yeah, you're doing a, a decent <laughs> enough job. <laughs> and archaeolo- uh, not you per se- personally, but the archaeologists, you know, they, they are on the forefront of that, obviously. I'll be back after this short break. Hello there, sorry to interrupt. My name's Dr Neil Buttery and I'm host of the British Food History Podcast, a podcast that you, as a fan of The Delicious Legacy, might be interested in. I explore British food and its history in all its glory, with interviews with special guests, recipes, reenactments, and tracking down forgotten recipes and hyper-regional specialities. Previous topics include medieval eels, 18th century dining, curry, London street food sellers, breakfast, and the good old Yorkshire pudding. Search for the British Food History Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And now, back to the delicious legacy. Cheers. Having so much uh, literature from um, centred around Athens, if we go back to your research and archaeological evidence from there, what does this tell you about the convergence or divergence of the textual evidence and archaeological finds for the cuisine, cooking and dining in ancient urban Athens? So yeah. Athens is... So it's unique in the sense that you have all these textual sources and they just give such brilliant detail. But at the same time, like I said, they kind of miss some of the picture where, you know, Athens is one of those sites that's in Eastern Greece. And as I mentioned, it becomes very goat heavy in the in the first half of the first millennium BC. Right. Mm. And so it's only by the classical period, so after 500 BC, that it starts becoming what I would call more urban in its sort of makeup of what it eats in terms of these animals, in the sense that it has a much more even distribution of sheep, goat, pig, and cow, right? And so it's it, as an urban center, I like to think, at least this is my hypothesis, it, these urban centers are drawing different cuisine from sort of their rural context and as a sort of cons- center of consumption rather than production of food, they make sure to get more diversity in their diet. And so they're getting a more even representation of sheep, goat, pig, and cow as Athens really grows into itself as a larger city by the 500, by about 500 BCE and downwards. And uh, it's around this time that I see a lot of changes. This is what the, this is my, my first uh, book, my first scholarly book that I'm writing is on uh, ancient Athenian cuisine. And uh, so there's a lot of changes that sort of happen right around that time. And, you know, you could think about it historically where, you know, we, we have little bits and pieces about Athens from pre-500 BCE. You know, Solon mm. created the law codes. We have before him these mythical kings from Theseus down to Erechtheus and whatnot. And uh, and then you, you get the Pisistratid tyranny. But really, Athens shows up on the sort of Greek world stage around 480 BCE. Uh, 490, I suppose, first, where they defeat the Persians at the Battle of Marathon. And then, of course... Um, They lead with the Spartans, the sort of effort against the Persians um, when Xerxes invades. And Athens gets burned down by Xerxes, um, but it really rebuilds after defeating the Persians at Salamis and then leading the Delian League. And it's leading the Delian League that gives Athens a lot of wealth. And it's very greedily, of course, instead of spending it on the larger defensive league, it spends it on itself, right? Yeah. And so by doing that, it creates a, a wealthy city. And uh, it's, you know, it's at this time we can see the change on the cuisine. So one of them is that the the diet gets more diverse. Like I mentioned with sheep, goat, pig and cow. 
And then you can also see this uh, with other fun little things that you get, like they're also eating more dog around this right, time. Right, okay. But also, like I have uh, this one example. Uh, I told you we don't have much fish from Athens so far, but we're getting more. But you get larger fish bones. We have some tuna vertebra from tuna. Mm -hmm. And one of them is this just enormous tuna vertebra that the fish specialist I'm working with, Tatiana Theodoropoulou, she says comes from like a tuna fish that must have been something like three meters long, if I'm remembering Mm. correctly. So really quite large and definitely imported, you know. Yeah. And uh, so it also, I, I have this red deer bone. So red deer, it's very similar to like elk for example, and so very large species of deer. They're not, they're extinct in the Southern Europe right now. They went extinct because of the loss of habitat, but back then they were fairly common. But the largest red deer bone I've ever seen I have from Athens. Right. It's from this well and it's a complete foot bone. And I have this photo of it that I took with a complete cow bone, the same cow bone type, and it's larger than the cow bone. Wow, okay. So we're talking an enormous red deer Probably something that would have been imported as well in that sense for this market that develops around this large city, right? Mm. But other interesting changes happen at the same time as well, where the way that they prepare the food. So I mentioned at Azoria um, the difference between dining at these uh, kind of festival settings versus at home is, is using a cleaver to chop up the animal at the early phase of butchery, right? Yeah. Well, in Athens, it's at this time, 500 BC or so, where the cleaver just almost completely takes over. So it's used for everything. And so I call this the development of professional butchery. Um, And so the cleaver just takes over. It's commercial, professional butchery. So people are now, instead of doing butchery at home, or maybe a farmer's doing butchery, mostly with knives, maybe for a festival, it's a priest that's using a cleaver occasionally. Now we get everything done very fast. Like you go to a butcher shop today Mm. in Athens, let's say, everything's done with a cleaver, right? Yeah. And very quickly done, very efficient, rigorous. You get the same kind of cuts of meat always. Ancient Athenians, they're butchers. They butchered meat differently than modern Athenians, but they're still using the cleaver for everything to chop it up into pieces. Mm. And so it's very efficient and commercial. So it creates these very different cuts of meat. And like I said, it's very good for getting the marrow out to create these stews. Most most meals were stewed back in the day. Mm. Barbecue, even though you read about it a lot, like in Homer, yeah, it's not that common. We don't have a lot of evidence for barbecue from the animal bone record. It's stews that everybody liked, right? Right. And which which makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to get into stews in Athens in a second. But uh, these cleaver chops are really cool because they're very rigorous and they create the same cuts of meat. And I map them out kind of on the on the uh, the skeleton of the animal to see, to show this. And then they they so it's this new cuisine that's developing. And at the same time it's a to 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 add to that, the cook pots are changing. So you get different kinds of how you cook this meat in a cook pot. And uh and not just meat, but vegetables and stuff like that as well for soups and whatever. And in in early Athens, so before sort of 550 or so BC, there's only one type of cook pot. It's this large stew pot that you can't even put a lid on. So it's only going to be good for fast boiling in a right. sense, right? And uh, and most of, and the really nice ones were imported from the island of Agina, right nearby. Yeah. And uh, because on Agina, they had this great micaceous clay and they figured out how to form the pot on a wheel at first, but then they put it on kind of like an anvil and they hammered it mm-hmm. until it be until the walls of the pot became super, super thin. We're talking, I don't know, a quarter of a centimeter thick, just very, very thin. And really, it's perfect for heating something up in, right? Yeah, yeah. And 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 the Athenians copied this a little bit, but the, the but they mostly the good ones were imported from Agina. But uh by the End of the 6th century BC, when they get wealthier, they start creating a second type of cook pot. And uh, both with this Agonetan stuff that's imported, but also in Athens. And it's a squatter, but it had, and it, and it had, you can put a lid on it. Right. right. So it's designed for a lid. So now you can do more stewing, what we would think of as a stew, when you stew something. Yeah, yeah. And then at the end of the 5th century, an even squatter flat bottomed. And that's key. That flat bottom uh, cook pot comes around that we call lopas. 
And uh, the earlier two types we call a kitra. And these are, these are the, la the second, this third type is called a lopas. And uh, it, it being flat bottomed, it can take a lid so it can be used for braising in, in kind of like a slow cooking type thing. But it can also be used for frying because it has that flat bottom. Of course. And so now we have totally different ways of cooking with these cook pots. It's much more diverse in how you can prepare food. And so I really call this the development of an urban cuisine. And uh, we see this first, as far as I can tell, in Athens. It's really what you'd call the first large city in Greece. But this kind of, at least these cookpot types end up showing up elsewhere in uh, other larger city centers. And in Hellenistic Knossos, we also get, like I said, that's a larger city as well. That's when we start seeing more chop marks on the bones, for example, same mm. kind of butchery, same kind of representation of animals, more even distribution. And so, you know, this urban cuisine starts spreading um, throughout the Greek world in cities, sort of in the classical and Hellenistic period. And it's funny because the Romans thought several of, uh, Roman archaeologists, I should say, thought that several of these developments were uh, a hallmark of Romanization. And uh, like this cleaver chop marks right. and stuff like that. And I'm like, no, 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 it's, a, it's an urban phenomenon because we see it in Greece for urban centers as well before that shows up in the, Ro in, in the Roman world and spreading out. And so, yeah. Huh. Do we see that in the East as well, or like um, Persia? And, I don't uh, know. I got to go read more of that. Uh, that also lags behind uh, some. Turkey has the same kind of thing mm. as, uh, so does Italy for that matter, of, of a, a lag in studying animal remains. Mm. Um, it's it, The Roman period is better understood more in sort of North Northern Europe, the, the the sort of Brit the British and French and German archaeologists um, in that in those areas were better at studying animal remains. Mm -hmm. I guess that's because they had fewer texts to really compare to, right? Yeah. They didn't want to compare it to all those Italian Roman texts. Yeah. They wanted to understand what was going on locally, and so they developed a better tradition of studying this stuff. And of so, course. you know, it was Mark Maltby and Chris Sita who first developed this idea. They call this cleaver chop stuff a need for speed. <laughs> is how they frame it, and uh, and so yeah, they were they they developed that from studying Roman British stuff, you know, like twenty thirty years ago, and uh, so yeah, we're just catching up, and so are the uh, the people studying Italian and Turkish and and assemblages from those areas, yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, this has been fascinating, and it's probably just uh, uh, like um, it's light touch of your uh, of your knowledge in the subject but um yeah I'll, I'll be looking forward to talk more about this stuff in the future on my part as i tend to focus on creating a finished dish exploring specific ingredients and of course and tantalizing morsels of recipes this is a more modern endeavor in a way right this isn't how the ancient greeks saw the idea of a cookbook i suppose well yeah modern but so yeah of course i mean you look at like a Picius. And the way he even, if you read like the original text, instead of like, I don't know, like Sally Granger's cookbook of him, which is great, but at the same time, it's not like Apicius gives exact measurements and like stuff like that. He, he, it's not like, it's more like what you think of if you go read like a cookbook from like a hundred years ago or mm. 150 years ago, or, you know, your mom's scrawlings of how to make, or your grandmom's scrawlings of how to make some dish. It's, it's much more off the top of the head, you know, yeah. you throw in some flour and some butter and some cheese and they don't give as much amounts, you know? And so, because they know, it's just a rule of thumb, of course, everybody knows. And so even Apicius is, yeah, it's very different. But yeah, ingredients, that's interesting because Athenian chefs in comedy, they, they focused on ingredients as well, but it wasn't the same thing. It was still, yeah, get some prawns, do this and boil it. And then, you know, it wasn't, get the specific type and shell it in this specific way and da 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 da, -da, -da, -da mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, We're, we've become much more atomized in how we describe things and rigorous, I suppose, than there was in the past. And and the idea of cookbooks, and it, it, it wasn't as developed because, of course, ordinary people wouldn't, wouldn't go to those yeah, things. They yeah. Just, yeah. It's something that we need to to reiterate quite often that, you know, <laughs> yeah, the common people that, yeah, they didn't have this luxury of even private kitchens, I suppose. It was something. That's an interesting question that's tough to answer. I tend to see a lot of cooking as fairly portable. Yeah. 
And probably when it's nice out, they probably cooked a lot outside, mm -hmm. right? So like you could think of like these braziers that we have where they're fairly portable. You get these, uh, there's really nice ones that we have from Delos that are just beautiful. You have the charcoal in the bottom and then the pot rests on top. But, you know, even from Athens, what we call a brazier, it's basically a wide, flat uh, ceramic vessel that you'd have coals in and then you'd nestle the pots in the coals right yeah, yeah yeah and so you don't even need a brazier to do that you just need a piece of land that's yeah. cleared and not going to be a fire hazard of course mm. and so that's probably how most of it was done obviously uh we don't have many poor people's houses from ancient greece unfortunately in in azoria for example we have more wealthy houses or at uh, linthos we have a lot of houses but they're again probably middle class to upper class type people. And they, they do have kitchens and hearths. Mm. Um, same thing at Azoria. They have, they have hearths for sure um, that are installed there. And it, uh, in both Azoria and, and Olynthus, it's fairly dense living. So if they're going to cook outside, they do have some courtyard space they could potentially do it in. But it, it wouldn't surprise me if it, w if it depended on the weather. Yeah. If a lot of it was done outside just uh, when you can. And when you can't, you might do it inside, would be my guess. But I also am not sure about that. But those things are fairly portable. Those braziers we get s imply a certain level of portability. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Fair enough, and, yeah. Uh, but certainly, look, people liked food. So I, I certainly don't want to give the impression that poor people did not take pride in what they ate and did not care about what they were eating. And one of the cool things about ancient Athens is it's clear that the wealth that existed there created a better diet for poorer people mm. as well. And we can tell that again from isotope analysis. Everybody's always, you know, uh, journalists and TV and media and the general public, they're all so excited about DNA, right? Like mm -hmm. ancient DNA is going to answer <laughs> all the questions that we have. You know what? I, I'm a big fan of DNA as well, don't get me wrong, but I tend to think that isotopes are are the really cool new development that's that that really is is more valuable than DNA in many ways because it can talk about like what people were eating and where they were moving in their lifetime. Absolutely. And so you can get this kind of resolution that's like unparalleled with isotopes to be able to answer a range of different questions about people and animals and plants and mostly or not not even organic stuff you can do it on inorganic stuff too we use isotopes to tell where marble comes from for example to be able to pro pro provenance where you have that marble statue do you want to know where that marble was quarried you do isotope analysis and so you know i think that they're the coolest thing in that sense because yeah organics in it well you don't have to agree with me that's okay but, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I, I just I, but so but so we can we, uh Analaia has published isotopes from athens um from people living in athens i should say yeah and what's really interesting is that yeah you, so you can compare the type of grave that people were buried in and people had a fairly similar diet regardless of whether they were in a you know, a pit with very few or no grave goods or whether they were in an elaborate tomb. Mm. And so, and even the enslaved people that she studied from near the silver mines at Lavrio mm -hmm. or La Laurion, they also had a similarly diverse and animal rich diet. Um, in fact, I, it's probably not true anymore, but at the time of initial publication back like Jeez, what is this? Would be almost ten years now, maybe. The initial publication, the one of her individuals that had the highest amount of animal protein con content in their diet from Athens also had one of the highest ever published from the pre-modern world, and so oh. yeah, so we're talking a significant component of an Athenian's diet was animal protein, but also a significant component would have been very varied and diverse. Mm. Um, I even imagine in rural areas it would have been varied and diverse, just maybe the animal protein component was not. Um, but the, the the vegetable component would have been very varied, you know, just like village life today. You get horta during different yeah. seasons and different things, you know, and so I would think so as well um, in the past. And so, but, you know, you can... 
We have these sacrificial calendars from ancient Athens inscribed on stone, and we know of other things from literary sources. And uh, Vincent Rosivac, who's done his analysis of sort of the sacrificial, sacrificial calendars of Athens, suggested that there's so many sacrifices going on from different groups. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it's the large polis that's doing a sacrifice. Sometimes it's your local ancestral village. Sometimes it's this cult, it's this, that disorganization or that organization or what, that a, an average Athenian citizen had access to free meat maybe once every 10 days. Mm-hmm. And so that's just from that, though. That's not even including your own stocks of animals or your patron having a feast or a wedding or whatever, right? Or going yeah. down to the market and buying some meat because we know that that happened as well. And so, yeah. so you know, they, the access to animal protein was, was fairly regular. And it's not just for men, it's for women as well. And we can tell that from the isotopic evidence um, at the same time. Interestingly enough, children were the ones that were eating less animal protein than adults. But most adults were eating a significant component, and we should imagine a fairly significant or a fairly diverse diet for most people in the past. And it would have had a seasonal rhythms that that, that I think is very important to consider. Mm. It's different from what we eat today. Yeah. um, If you see what I mean. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, in a way, yeah, these are the main points of difference between a modern and an ancient Greek uh, diet. Yeah. A lot more seasonal, and today isn't the same. Yeah, well, with our refrigeration and the ability to transport uh, stuff and cure it. I mean, you know, cured food was definitely extremely important. Um, we, they definitely, we know from amphorae and so containers where they ship this stuff. and uh, But also textual sources that salted fish was an extremely uh, big industry in the past. Yeah. Um, and so that would have been a key component of, of, of moving things around. But you could also cure stuff, for example, in honey. They didn't have sugar until after Alexander the Great. But uh, honey, uh, you, can, you can cure stuff in meat and veggies or fruits or whatever. And then I, I think I have evidence for cured uh, pork in Athens where there, I have these, uh, these pig cheeks – Mm-hmm. And these pork shoulder blades, where the butchery pattern on them is really weird, where they have like, you know, half a dozen to a dozen knife slices on them. And I, the only thing I can think of is that these are cured. These have been salted or dried or something like that, because that's when you, uh, the, the, once the meat becomes salted or dried, it's, it's tougher to get off the bone. So you leave more, more cut marks on the bone. And so this has been demonstrated ethnographically and experimentally that that can happen. Mm. And so I get these cured pork cheeks and pork shoulder blades, um, pork shoulder. And so whether it's salted or smoked or dried or all three or some combo, I don't know. Yeah. But it would have been a delicacy as well. Um, certainly those cheeks, what's really interesting about them, they're the mandible of the pigs. And uh, the mandible is fantastic for three reasons. One, I have all those knife slices that tells me it's cured. Two, I get them chopped into halves or thirds. So they're little dainties in a sense. They're, they're, they're obviously something that's a bite-sized morsel that they would have really like would have had a lot of flavor. Yeah. If you see what I mean. Yeah. And then, and then third, the great thing about teeth is you can age them. And if you have the front part of the mandible, the canine, it tells you whether they're male or female. Right. And what's really interesting is these cured pork cheeks almost entirely come from adult female pigs. So the breeding stock, while the other pig jaws that I have that are not butchered like this, they're from younger males. So, you know, they only keep a small, just a handful of males alive longer for breeding mm. while they keep all these sows alive. And they're the ones that have a lot of meat on them. Perfect for curing. Right? right, perfect for salting. You want to, you want something with some flesh on its bones if you're going to put the effort into curing it. And so the younger males are are the fresh pork, <laughs> while the uh, the few adult uh, female sows are turned into these. At least their shoulder blades and their shoulders and their cheeks are turned into something like guanciale or whatever. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, thank you so much for your uh, knowledge. Yeah, and, uh, thanks. It was good spending. to be here. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, let's um, say goodbye and um, let's um, have another session soon.
Yeah, thanks very much, Tom. It was my pleasure. Great, great, great. Thanks, Flint. Speak to you soon. I'm looking forward to finding uh, out more fascinating facts about ancient gastronomy and cooking. Thanks for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Remember, if you want the podcasts early and ad-free with additional extra content, please go to my Patreon and subscribe there from $3 a month. This also helps me create the podcasts more frequently and spend more time researching for each episode. So please, 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 please go to my Patreon page and subscribe there. There are different levels for different benefits and um, also you're going to get a huge thank you from me on the next episode. This podcast can only happen with your generous support. So share and uh, review and rate the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube and wherever else you get your podcast from. Thank you, I've been Thomas Dinas and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. I'll be back with Flint in another episode soon, so stay tuned for another archaeogastronomical adventure. <laughs>